like to call the Human Services Commission meeting to order at 7.03 p.m. Um, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, Edith, would you like to take roll call? Yes, thank you. Commissioners, MJ Badeghi? Here. Joe Carlucci? Harsh Gohill? Susan Hayes? Here. Kelsey Lamb? Here. Mira Puri? Here. Patty Powers? Here. Mike Sedlak? Chairperson Janine rubin -Obra. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. Um, staff, are there any agenda amendments? No agenda and amendments. I'll just throw in real quick. We are missing a few commissioners, as you can tell, um, commissioners. Um, wanted to let you know that Harsh um, regrettably chose to resign due to increased responsibilities. Um, so we will be missing Harsh. And then also, um, I got an email a couple of days ago from Mike Sedlak. He um, is moving to moving out of state. Um, and he spent 38 years here in Pleasanton. 25 of those years was on um, various commissions and committees, as many of you know. So he will be missed as, as will Harsh. So, and Joe is just out of uh, state for the meeting tonight. So that's your commissioner update for this evening. Thank you, Jay. Mm -hmm. uh, we will move on to item one, approval of the regular meeting minutes from the October 6th meeting. Um, did anybody have any um, corrections or comments to the minutes? No. Nope. Okay, can I have a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Great, a second, please. I second it. Great, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Did you get that, Edith? Yes, I did, thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, move on to item two, introductions, awards, recognitions for a presentation on Open Heart Kitchen from Heather Grow. Welcome, Heather. Hello, good evening, commissioners. Nice to see all of you again. Good evening to you. So let me, Heather, if you don't mind, let me just tee this up real quick. Um, um, I, about three weeks ago, I asked Heather, maybe it was two weeks ago, I don't know, uh, it was short notice. I asked Heather to come and give a presentation to the Human Services Commission. Um, and it was just, I just wanted, there's, she has a lot of projects going on at Open Art Kitchen, um, and she's going to share most of them with you this evening and provide an opportunity for um, questions or discussion, but uh, I wanted to share with the commission um, and the community for that matter, all the good things that Open Art Kitchen is doing. So we're going to tag team a presentation. She's going to be doing all the all the talking and presenting and I'll just be doing the background IT stuff. Yes, Aaron, I know that probably scares you, but uh, I'll give them a good <laughs> shot. I trust you, Jay, you got this. <laughs> You're not wise. <laughs> So, okay, so I'll go ahead and turn it. For those that I think everybody does know, Heather Grow, she's the executive director of Open Art Kitchen. Um, and uh, for, with that, I wanna thank you, Heather, for all your service to the Tri-Valley, specifically to Pleasanton for, for our purposes, but thank you for all that you do through Open Art Kitchen and thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, Jay. Uh, so to say this past year has been challenging is definitely an understatement. We accomplished things we would have never thought possible. I want the commission to know that your city staff has have been instrumental in helping to meet the increased demand for our services and have been a key partner to Open Heart Kitchen. Um, in the summer of 2020, Alameda County was running an emer emergency food distribution at the fairgrounds. And when we heard that they were going to discontinue the distribution in November 2020, we worked with the cities and the county to take over the operations. Initially, we were in the same space at the fairgrounds the county was using. And as COVID vaccinations became available, that space uh, was used for the massive vaccination effort at the fairgrounds. And we moved to a smaller building 
And when the fairgrounds decided to open for the county fair this fall, we worked with Pleasanton staff once again, and they were kind enough to allow us to utilize the parking lot of the senior center as we all worked with Workday to set up a distribution site in their parking lot. I have a video to show you that was filmed as we were making that transition last month. Take it away, Jay. Okay, well, pressure's on. All right, so let's see. Let's see. All right, can you all see the, the YouTube video? No. No, it's still on your Word document. Okay, it's churning, dang it. Did you share the Word document, Jay, or your screen? I shared the Word document, but then I clicked on the link to get to the YouTube video. Uh, it's only gonna share the Word document. So go ahead and uh, now, now hit share screen and share your YouTube video or share your whole screen. There you go. Yeah, but I don't think that's doing, it's not, uh, maybe my connection at home isn't, it wasn't a problem before. Oh, here we go. Maybe this will work. and I am one of the program managers for the grocery distribution site. And I'm Christy Williams, and I am the other program manager at the grocery distribution site. So currently our, our grocery distribution site is taking place at the Pleasanton Senior Center. This is our official last day at this site, and we'll be moving to Workday on Tuesday, October 19th. We're really excited about the move. Uh, the Senior Center has been awesome to let us stay here for so long. It's been about twice as long as they had originally planned. Uh, we're excited for the move to Workday and all of our volunteers and our clients are excited about the move as well. We'll be able to have a lot more fresh produce and um, cold items. Cold more cold cold. Storage items. We'll be able to have a lot more cold items and get more variety to our folks out of our new location. And so currently at this location, we're serving 566 households a week with 1,935 members. So there's a lot of people come to, coming through our line to get the groceries that they need. There's definitely food insecurity with Pleasanton at 40% of our clients. So there's a definite need here in Pleasanton. And the people that come through here have been amazing. They're so grateful and appreciative and uh, really just let us know that this is a really good safety net for them right now. Absolutely. And a lot of our clients are picking up. We were surprised. A lot of them are picking up for many people that live in like their apartment complex, their senior home complex, or we have one gentleman that's actually picking up for people who are unsheltered. Yeah, he's amazing. And yeah. people like that just keep us going. Some, some days it's hard. Some days it's 110. Some days it's 40 degrees. Um, it's, it's not easy, but meeting folks like that from our community who are taking the time out of their out of their day to he's he's spending an entire day getting food to 20 different folks um it just makes us feel like you know our little inconveniences of being maybe too hot are very small compared to what they're dealing with and it's just very heartwarming to see so many wonderful people absolutely and we could not run this site just the two of us <laughs> So behind us is a team of individuals <laughs> that includes staff members and wonderful volunteers from Open Heart Kitchen and Tri-Valley Haven. It's a combination of both programs. And most of them have been with us from the very beginning, especially the volunteer staff. We've had a few staff changes as people went away to college. 
but we we've just been super lucky we are we've we have this wonderful team of volunteers that are very dedicated passionate and like christy said weather conditions aren't always optimal mm -hmm. and they come out they're ready to go they're happy they just are just passionate and happy about serving the community and we love being part of that team their oh, energy yeah. inspires us daily and you know we love what we do but they make it even more worthwhile so Absolutely. we're so happy to be part of this team here at the grocery distribution site yeah we something that shonda and i both say a lot um the people will be effusively thanking us and we're telling them, no, we feel like we're the lucky ones to be able to help you. We're, we're so lucky to be with Open Heart Kitchen and, um, and fill this need for our community. And, uh, and as Shonda was talking about, the volunteers that we have are just so hardworking and um, really, really help keep things moving and we, we couldn't do it without them. Absolutely. Our new site will be located at Workday, and we're looking forward to this next chapter. So my name is Scott. My wife Barbara and I have been volunteering with the grocery distribution program here since the beginning, back last November. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience from a variety of angles. Uh, the recipients, of course, number one. People are so appreciative and expressing their, their uh, thanks for the opportunity to kind of improve their situation from food insecurity. So it's wonderful from that point of view, community service angle. Uh, the staff members from the two organizations running the program here have been wonderful in their guidance, um, in their support and direction for the volunteers. And it, it's a great interaction between volunteers and staff members here that come out and serve the community. Uh, the, the terrific uh, nutritional value um, of the foods that they served, it's, it's well balanced. It's a nice combination of things um, with the fresh produce, some canned goods that will hold up and some meats as well. Um, so overall, it's been a terrific experience and we're glad to help out. So we hope that you get a little taste of what we're doing down here and uh, that you have been inspired uh, and maybe you'll want to volunteer with us sometime. We'd love to have you. And like Christy says, teamwork makes, makes the, the dream, dream work. work. <laughs> okay, are we done? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. All right. Thank you. And now if you wouldn't mind bringing up the slides, I know I'm going to challenge you tonight. <laughs> see. All right. I think I got this. That's the easy part. You can see that? Yes. OK. OK. So if you can go to the next slide, please. I'd like to highlight a couple partners. Uh, the Alameda County Community Food Bank has supplied the bulk of the food distributed at the drive-through grocery distribution. Um, they are also working closely with us to assist our clients with CalFresh applications. We're doing CalFresh outreach at the distribution site. And if people are interested in applying for CalFresh, we can connect them with food bank staff and they'll walk them through the entire process. We've also partnered with Tri-Valley Haven to run the distribution. Our staff and volunteers have been working alongside each other for a year now. Um, with Tri-Valley Haven's help, we've provided groceries to over 3,300 households with a total of over 11,000 household members. Numbers are important, but the stories from the front line speak volumes. Um, we recently had a delivery delay um, 
at the distribution and the frozen hamburger meat we normally provide wasn't available for the first hour of service. Uh, a woman in the drive through line was almost in tears because that's how much her family needed that food. She waited in the parking lot until the delivery came in because she didn't want to leave and take a chance coming back later, even though we assured her that we'd set it aside for her. We're hoping to take what was born out of this emergency situation and transition the drive-through grocery distribution project to longer term solutions for food insecurity in the Tri-Valley. We have been in discussions with the Tri-Valley cities and community partners about establishing a regional food storage facility. And we believe that facility is the next step in addressing the challenges that existed for our local food pantries and providers pre-COVID, as well as addressing the increased demand for services going forward. Next slide, please. As dining rooms were shut down in early 2020, we increased our street outreach efforts and began delivering prepared meals to the unhoused community six days a week. We supply one hot meal and one shelf-stable bagged meal each day. In the beginning, it was difficult for our outreach team to navigate the many challenges our unhoused clients were facing. Our team identified a strong need for CityServe's continuous presence in our outreach program. So we began a formal partnership with CityServe to have one of their staff members assist our team two days a week. The collaboration between Open Heart Kitchen and CityServe of the Tri-Valley has been helpful to connect some of our most chronic unhoused individuals facing multiple issues with mental health, addiction, and housing to services that'll help them move forward. Connecting clients through this collaboration has helped individuals build relationships with service providers. Because of the time spent building relationships, clients are beginning to take an active role in changing their trajectory by working with different service providers to acquire resources and take steps out of homelessness. Next slide, please. And now on to the Vineyard Project. Um, the Vineyard Architect from Gunkel Architecture came up with this line um, from the voices of many, a unified vision. And it really encompasses the entire process from the early brainstorming to the various community meetings on design and the fundraising partnerships. I think everyone has been impressed with the collaborative effort uh, to make this ambitious project a reality. Next slide. And the um, owner is Housing Consortium of the East Bay. They are also the developer of the project and will be the on-site manager. And Open Heart Kitchen will be one of the anchor tenants providing the kitchen operations and the homeless refuge of Livermore um, is the other anchor tenant providing the overnight shelter. And as we get closer to opening, more providers will come on board. Next slide. So re-envisioning the use of the property went from idea to planning in 2017 with the local cities, service providers, and faith-based community with a mission to meet a myriad of needs for unhoused and in low-income community. Next slide. And kicking off with a series of programming and conceptual design meetings, the stakeholders began re-envisioning the site for the future. It was immediately clear that there was not enough space to accommodate everyone's wish list. While working through different solutions and priorities, the architects team suggested a co-working concept where spaces would be shared and the services would be provided based on a schedule. In addition to solving a space constraint issue, the co-working concept also greatly expanded the potential impact the development could have on the clients. From those initial concepts, the idea of the resource center was born. Next slide. And the resource center is directly adjacent to the food service kitchen and will provide case management support services, training and education, and a postal address for the community's unhoused, laundry and shower facilities, and the winter shelter. 
At the heart and mind of the resource center will be a person at a greeting, a desk greeting and assisting arriving clients and volunteers. And towards the back of this picture, um, you can see what looks like a glass wall. And that leads to a community room, which simultaneously serves as a waiting area for services and a living room for clients to decompress. All the conference rooms and offices will be shared by different organizations who only need part-time space for their activities. Next slide, please. And many of the spaces in the resource center will serve different roles throughout the week. During the day, the multi-purpose room will be a dining hall, a meeting room in the afternoons and evenings, and overflow for the overnight shelter at night. And next slide, please. Of course, this new mixed use community will also include 24 units of permanent supportive housing managed by the Housing Consortium of the East Bay with the 18 studio units, five one bedrooms and two, uh, a two bedroom managers unit. Next slide. So with construction scheduled to begin at the end of the year and anticipating that the door will be open to residents and clients in early 2023, Vineyard is generating excitement in the community and exemplifies a regional approach to addressing our larger community's housing crisis. Next slide. And in closing, as we embark on another round of human services grant applications, I hope this presentation has helped shine a light on some of the few examples of how all of the different CBOs constantly leverage any and all resources available to help serve our community. I know as you all review applications that are sometimes extremely specific to particular programs, it can be frustrating to be in a position to pick who, choose, who, who gets what and how much. Um, and I hope that you can see that your grant recipients tend to work every angle to maximize the benefit to the community. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, great presentation. And I am uh, impressed as always with the incredible work you guys do in our communities. I can't wait to see the, the Vineyard Project come to life. Are you guys still in Danville? We are. Um, we um, had to temporarily move because we were over capacity at RBC. So we're in Danville right now and can't wait for Vineyard to be open so we can move back to Livermore. That's great. Commissioners, does anybody have any questions for Heather? Or comments? How's work day going so far, Heather? Our staff love those super fancy tents that they set us up with. It's going to be much easier in the rain now. Definitely, that's great. They were a great, I'll just, for the, for the commission, Workday was a great community partner. Um, and uh, once that connection was made, you know, went with Heather and, oh, what kind of tent do you need? What kind of sides do you want? And, you know, at the senior center, Heather had to order the tents. She had to say what she wanted. And, you know, it was like a smorgasbord of options, I guess, for just for the tents at, at Workday. So uh, at least the transition was really great. And, and uh, Workday was welcoming to, to get that, get it going over there on their campus. Um, Susan, you have your hand up? I do. I found the button. Mm -hmm. uh, Heather, amazing job navigating all this and and uh, and you and, and the community partners to have Vineyard come online. It seems like so quickly now, um, but uh, well done. And it's very exciting. The um, question I have, though, has to do with um, the new Workday setup. They are located close to BART. And I'm wondering if you have seen um, any people coming in for food um, from public transportation. The, you know, BART and the buses run right near there. Um, has that proven to be helpful to some of our residents who may not have cars but still have food insecurity? 
I'd have to check with staff. I know that we do serve a few individuals that walk up, um, but as far as I know, they were um, people that are already in Pleasanton um, and not coming from BART. Um, I think they both have bicycles, so they're probably riding their bikes from wherever they're living. Okay, thanks. Hey Heather, I have a question. Um, I mean, that's really fantastic work that you've done. And I'm so excited to hear about the Vineyard 2 actually having dates that are going to happen. What will be the, the uh, picture or the setup once it's open? Will there continue to have like satellite food distribution places like at Workday that'll be in Pleasanton? Um, the distribution at Workday was really meant as an emergency service during COVID. Um, it's not something Open Heart Kitchen really imagines doing ongoing. Um, we would really like to transition to a more permanent solution where we have the facilities to support our local pantries, um, where the local pantries, some of them could not accommodate the massive drive-through operation. Um, we would really like to get get any any service, any food storage needs that they have beefed up, so that we can go back to kind of our quote unquote normal emergency food operations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And where where are those pan where, where would those pantries be? Um, they are existing providers. Uh, Pleasanton is a little light on pantries. We do have the uh, newer service at the Muslim Community Center, East Bay. Mm -hmm. And so um, we would definitely love to continue working with them to make sure they have everything they need to continue their own distribution. Um, and we have been trying to identify partners that would like to set up um, a new distribution or a new pantry in Pleasanton. We know it's definitely a need um, in town. So I don't know where the hands up button is on my, <laughs> I'm not as fancy as Susan, <laughs> but I had a question. Um, Heather, are you, when does, when is the plan to resume doing the meals at the senior center again for the seniors? Um, well, we are doing meals now, but they are drive up, pick up and go. Um, I'm sorry, so, I'm like the hot lunches kind of thing. Oh, sure. So congregate meals. Um, our plan is to try to get through uh, the upcoming flu season and fingers crossed, we do not have another Delta or something else and we can get folks back in. We're actually excited that we know it's going to be Pleasanton that we open first. Um, it's just, it's a great operation there. We have great staff there and it's, um, it, it's not one of our smaller sites. It's, it's one of our more reasonable sites um, where we, we couldn't do Dublin because there's just too many people right now. So we're definitely, it's going to be kind of our guinea pig on trying to open and maybe doing a hybrid service. We've been um, surveying the uh, seniors. Some of them are more comfortable than others. So we know we're going to have to be very fluid and work with everyone at first. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I know we're looking forward to the day in the future when more volunteers can come back and work. Um, our workability students do miss working at the Sage Cafe with you guys. Um, look forward to when that can happen again. We're gonna be happy to have everyone back eventually. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments from anybody? Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Heather. Really appreciate um, seeing all the, all the great work you guys are doing. Um, and, and thank you for coming tonight. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Heather. You, you, you're welcome to, oh, I was gonna say, you're welcome to join us for the rest of the meeting or you can, uh, you can <laughs> go back and enjoy the rest of your evening off the Zoom meeting. So thank you very much for your time. Bye, Heather. Thanks, Heather. Um, okay, let's move on to item three um, to um, open the meeting to, to the public. Uh, Aaron, do we have anybody uh, in the waiting room? Uh, no attendees. Well, one attendee, but uh, no speaker cards. Okay, so I will close public comment and move to matters uh, before the commission. Item four. Um, review and approve the 2022 Human Services Commission meeting schedule. Um, Jay, is there a staff report for that? 
Just a real brief staff report. This is a regular item that we do on an annual basis uh, as required by the Muni Code. Typically the uh, Human Services Commission meets the first Wednesday of every month. Um, and so on the agenda report, um, it has those dates listed specifically. Staff is recommending that uh, we have um, no meeting in January and no meeting in July. Typically the January meeting falls around the first of the first of the year and 4th of July usually falls around the July meeting. So staff's recommendation is to have all hold all the meetings except for January and July, but that's up for commission discussion. If you feel a need to meet in January and or July, that is up to the commission to uh, take action on this evening. I will note that as we usually do, um, um, the March meeting, which is March 2 of next year, the grants meeting will start at six o'clock uh, because as you know, that's a long meeting. So with that, um, I'll end my report and we'll send it back to the commission. Actually, Jay, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. When do you envision us back in person, back in chambers? So um, that hasn't been discussed yet. I would think that we, because of our size, we are going to be one of the last ones to go back. Um, and I say that because um, the last it was discussed, the commissions that are five, um, they can be up on the dais um, and be socially distanced. Okay. But the commissions that are more than five um, will be the last ones to come back. And we have nine people on our commission um, when we're full. Um, and so based on that, um, don't know when, um, I don't know when five member commissions are going to, are coming back either. So hopefully in the spring, but that's, that's just a, a guess at this point. Thanks. Uh, does anybody have any comment on the dates, um, or any changes that they would like to make? No. Nope. Okay. Do we vote on, we vote on this, right, Jay? Please. So do I have a motion to accept um, the first Wednesday of the month for the 2022 schedule, except for January and July. So moved. Second. Thank you, Patty. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, we will go to item five, review and comment on the library and recreation department quarterly report for July through September of this year. Um, Jay, do we have a staff report? Uh, yes, we do, but I'm, I'm just gonna be real brief and just say that it's in your packet. And um, basically if you have any, it's for the months of July through September of 2021. Um, and it's kind of a snapshot in time of the activities that uh, we've been um, hosting and putting on throughout the entire department on the library and recreation side. So um, if there's feedback from the commission, um, now's the time to give that feedback so we can take it back. And our um, communications coordinator for the department um, puts this together on a quarterly basis and then wraps it up into a, an annual report as well. So um, the communications coordinator is open for any and all feedback from all of our five commissions that we have in our department. So. With that, um, I'll end my report. Thank you, Jay. Any comments on um, the quarterly report? I, I just make a general comment that I think that the report really provides a really good perspective on the scope of all the services that are provided. Um, me in particular, don't appreciate all that goes on and probably the public in general doesn't know either uh, but I think it was really good to see some upward trends in a lot of things um, and I thought it was just really well put together thank, thank you, you MJ. for that feedback MJ. I agree I was impressed that there were 8,500 new registered card holders I you know in one quarter that, that's a lot <laughs> oh that is a lot Oh, uh, but Jay, does that report go out to the public? I should yes. know that, but I don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. And that's, that's really the intention, right? I think historically, 
recreation departments, human services departments, and library departments aren't really, we're good at putting programs on, or we're not really good at selling and telling what we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this is an approach to show that in, you know, quantifiable numbers, basically. So it's, yeah. it's good that it's good that we're doing it um, to show, you know, the impact that we have on the community. Yeah, speaking of that, um, I remember before COVID, we talked about, um, oh, Patty just said her Wi-Fi is not good. So she's going to be, oh, there you are. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But we talked about developing a communication plan to let the public know what what our commission does. Um, So maybe that's something we can talk about next year sometime. Yes, um, absolutely. We're uh, um, what the council did was they they wrapped that into that communication plan into the next human services needs assessment. So there'll be a portion of that needs assessment that will hopefully be very applicable, so we can have a communications plan letting the community know what the human service commission does and what human services does in the city of Pleasanton for you know the community. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine that would help with recruitment as well. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Yep. Um, Any other comments on the quarterly report? Okay. Um, Any public comment, Aaron? Oh. No public comment. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Um, So does anybody have any other matters um, that they'd like to discuss? Or I know we don't have commission reports right now or future agenda topics, Any anybody, anything from anyone? Yeah, I had just another observation. Um, I did have a chance to look through and listen to the Pleasanton City Survey um, that the uh, City Commission went through. And um, you know, obviously it was very favorable, <laughs> I thought. Um, and I just congratulate you know the workers in, in the city on really having such a, a good attitude and, and good results during the COVID period. Um, I was wondering if anybody had observed anything in that report that would be relevant to us. Um, I noticed that, I mean, I, I didn't actually, I noticed that in terms of concerns, you know, people had in the community I was looking for things that might affect what we're doing. And the only thing I really could pick up on is the, like the homeless was like at 2%. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's pretty low uh, concern level for a, a matter that's as serious as that. But I, may, I don't know if that reflects that most people think that it's being taken care of <laughs> adequately or if they don't even see the issue, but I just wondered if anybody else had any, any observations about our, you know, anything we should be doing relative to that report. Anybody have any response? There, there, there was a real good summary of it in the Pleasanton Weekly. Okay. Where I read it. It doesn't take you like hours to read it if you're interested in, in getting the the summary. MJ, I will say that, you know, we talked about it at the managers at our managers meeting earlier this week. And um, one of the, um, and I'm going to add a little, a little bit here, because I'm not sure of the exact term, but there was, you know, services that the library and recreation department provide um, went, went down a little bit from strongly, agree, from further away from strongly agree to mm-hmm. okay. agree. And so, you know, we're looking at ways to address that. Do people make the nexus of homeless, homelessness? And that's kind of, we're kind of the library and recreation department is the um, facilitator of the homeless outreach uh, within the city. I don't think the greater community makes that connection. They may think it's the police department. Police department does play a role. They have two police officers that do homeless outreach, but um Speaking from our department, that was the one thing that stuck out um, from from a staff's perspective. Is our our ranking went down, you know, a little bit from strongly agree. Whether that's COVID or, to me, that makes sense because during COVID we offered a lot fewer programs, and so we were able to, 
you know, not take as many families and individuals and programs. And so we, less people were satisfied because they couldn't get their kids or friends into programs that they used to be able to. So um, that, I haven't looked into that level of detail on why those responses were that way. And I don't know if we, we could find out why those responses were that way. Yeah, or maybe it's just lack of visibility. I mean, lack of, you know, it's not at the front of their mind because they weren't using as many services. Yeah, because so we weren't offering as many. If yeah. we're using them, they liked them, you know? So there's just like, oh, I think things are fine rather than yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love them. Yeah, yep. And so also what's going on with the uh, the uh, new park uh, approval? Was it, there was going to be, you know, we had that review and it seems like there was going to be a like on-site tour or something. Yeah, for the community, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the All Abilities Playground? Yeah. yeah. They had it. They had a workshop at the yeah, site. They, mm. they did. Oh, they had that already? Okay. Yeah, and it went back to council, and council said continue, continue on forward refining the design. So I think, and Edith, you might correct me if I'm wrong. I think the consultants are going back refining a design. I think the council picked one of the two designs to focus on. There was two, two separate designs, and so they're incorporating all the public feedback that they got, and they're going. The consultant's job is to come back with what they think the community said and say, "Here you go, City of Pleasanton. This is what this is what we." Um, or planning for going forward. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have anything else before we, oh, Susan. Found my button. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I wanted to let everyone know that the Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance is going to host a regional recognition event of, um, of our nonprofit community on December 7th. That's a Tuesday at 6.30. Uh, it's going to be at the Bankhead Theater, and this year it is going to highlight um, the six beneficiary organizations from the Tri-Valley Nonprofit Fund, um, which raised $183,000 in COVID uh, relief funding for them and distributed it immediately to them so they could scale to meet the increased needs um, during lockdown. Um, they're also going to um, recognize the donors uh, and in, including the matching donors, everyone from the large matching corporate donors down to um, the kids who did um, music recitals online, whose you know parents you know paid. I mean, it's it's going to be a very heartwarming evening. And then our our members are um, going to they have an option to um, uh, to recognize their. Um, the people who donate time and money to their organization. So beyond those six, um, but it's going to be a wonderful evening. And, you know, we're also going to recognize um, verbally uh, city staff from the three. Um, yes, Jay, that would be you and Becky. Um, and uh, those from Livermore and Dublin who helped us um, identify which complementary safety net service providers um, would be important targets for the fund. So it's going to be a very exciting night. Um, it's a free event, um, but you do need to register and you can register at tvnpa.org. It's very easy. Just put in your name and number of people and you're set. So you can find out more there. You said Tuesday, the December 7th, the evening? Tuesday, December 7th, yes. Okay. We just got okay. the okay on that um, a short while ago. And as you know, the press release just went out. So um, it's out there. And so we're going to also have entertainment, David Victor of um, Harmony and Healing and um, former Boston frontman um, is going to be performing. And so is a, a local young um, concert pianist, Michael Hong. And um, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be an exciting night. It's gonna be an uplifting night. I mean, we have something to celebrate. You know, we all came together, even as we faced our own challenges. So you know, it's, I hope you guys all consider coming. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, I have just a couple things. Okay. Um, wanted to let the commission know that Robert Taylor. Um, who is the executive director of senior support program of the Tri-Valley, or I say is, 
for another week or so. Um, he is moving on to Sac the Sacramento area. So um, the interim um, executive director is going to be Marcel, who is the director of admin services there now. She's been with a uh, senior support program the Tri-Valley for, I think, three years or so. So um, it is up to the board um, what they um, choose to do for the next executive director. But uh, um, that's a little bit of a change for the local nonprofits in the Pleasanton area. Um, and then as far as future agenda topics, what I wanted to sort through between now and December is, um, remember in our agendas before the pandemic, we had... Um, committee reports um, at the bottom. And there was commissioners that were, you know, appointed to go to city serve meetings or other, other types of meetings. So I want to reset those meetings and figure out number one, what those meetings are. And then, so we'll probably have a discussion at next month, um, what the meetings are and which commissioners want to start attending those. And I need to make sure that the, the organizations are still having those meetings. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it goes, but that's my intent for one of the items for next, uh, next month to discuss bringing back those, uh, some subcommitt subcommittee reports. So. Great. Great. Okay. Anything else from anybody before we vote to adjourn? Okay. Do I have a, a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Patty. Second? A second. Thank you, Mira. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, meeting is adjourned at 7.49 p.m. Our next meeting is December 1st. Look forward to seeing you all there and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thanks, Janine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.